Hi there, thanks for joining us again. This is Space Nuts. My name is Andrew Dunkley. Thanks for your company. Coming up, we will be looking at a couple of things. Mars quakes. Looks like they're happening uh, at a faster and more furious pace than ever thought. Uh, and that's because we can detect them now with uh, much more accuracy. Also, the Parker uh, Solar Probe uh, has made the news again. Uh, it is skimming around the sun, almost literally, but it's doing it at a thunderclap race, uh, a pace. And we'll also be looking at a supernova first seen in 1181, but now we know all about it, or at least more than they did back then. That's all coming up on this edition of Space Nuts. 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And here again to furnish us with his knowledge, or at least help my son move furniture because he's got a new apartment in Sydney, uh, is <laughs> Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Just let me know, and yeah, we'll we'll be there helping. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, we're planning the trip down. He hasn't quite got it yet. All the legal stuff, you know. Well, oh, tell me about to deal it. with that first. Yeah, where, where, mm. whereabouts is it? What suburb is he in? Uh, Campsy. Uh, oh, more specifically, uh, a place called Clempton Park, which is very pretty, leafy little suburb. Uh, and best of all, he's not on a main road whatsoever, so yeah. no traffic. Yeah. Very, very hard to do in Sydney. <laughs> very hard to do. Yep. Um, we're kind of we're quite proud of him because he's managed to do this all by himself in the second most difficult real estate market in the world. Yeah, which I think's really impressive. It is. So, um, yes, ladies, he's a catch. Okay. Um, <laughs> now, <laughs> there you go. Well, lady um, friends know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Now, um, before we get into our stories, you've just come back from a, a little trip to South Australia where you um, took a tour group around to show them rocks and things. Uh, it must have been exciting. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was a lot more exciting than you made it sound. <laughs> uh, it's, so it was, a, it was a round trip, really. We started off in Adelaide, headed up to Port Augusta, and then um, to Kubapedi via Woomera, which is a name I've had in my vocabulary since I was about six, uh, because the, um, you, you know, it was always in the news was Woomera when I was growing up in the 1950s, mm. uh, that um, this was the spaceport for... Uh, for British rocket tests and all kinds of other things. And it was all happening very much front of mind, very uh, prominent in the media. But, but I've never been, Andrew. Never visited no, Woomera until are. now. And uh, it's worth a look. Look, you, you would enjoy it too. There's a lot of vintage space stuff there, uh, reminiscent of, I guess, the Kennedy Space Center, but a, an earlier generation uh, when mm. uh, rocketry uh, was uh, in, in its kind of the modern era of rocketry was in its infancy in the post-World War II period. Uh, lots to see, some really interesting uh, aircraft, uh, missiles, rockets, and all the rest of it. Yeah. Is the um, Australia's first ever rocket still in that chook shed? That <laughs> That's probably. <laughs> I didn't see it's it there. there somewhere, apparently. <laughs> yes, yeah. it, it, it will be, yeah. But, but of course, it's still an active uh, site. I think it's the RAAF that operates now. The, there's the Woomera prohibited area. It's a huge area of South Australia. Uh, I don't mm. know how many thousand square kilometres it is, but uh, they still do launches, and people in the area, the station um, the station. Uh, dwellers, station holders, people have got sheep stations and things like that. They they get told that every so often, oh, we, we're going to evacuate you for a day. So, well, they do something. Wow. <laughs> and it's very secret. So we didn't find out about any of that, but we did talk about the history and it was great. And then... Uh, yeah, of course, the... um, I, I should mention that the reason it's uh, called uh, Woomera is because yes. that's a um, uh, um, an Aboriginal device to launch a spear. It is gives you give, yeah. gives a spear a, 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 a much greater an extra reach, kick, yeah. a great yeah. name, mm. great name. Mm. You met and you then, met some space nutters too. We did, yes. We we, we followed the path round to. Um, Places like uh, uh, Williams Creek and Marie. Marie is interesting because it's got a uh, it's got a man. 
uh, the Mari Mon, which oh, uh, yes, when, you, right. when you see it from the air is is a an Aboriginal elder probably. He's got a long beard uh, and he's four kilometres long, <laughs> and nobody knows how he got there. But it looks yeah. as like done by bulldozers or something like that. Uh, and Possibly. then and then down to Akarula, a place where there's a dark sky park, and to a place called uh, Nilpena. And in fact, the Nilpena Ediacara National Park. Uh, Ediacara is the name of the hills in which some very interesting fossils were found some years ago. And these are the uh, fossils of the first animals, basically, the first things that moved around on beds of uh, microbial mats uh, in, in shallow seas. And we met the, uh, the chief ranger there, uh, Kim Goya, I think is the way his name is pronounced, who <laughs> flashed his Space Nuts T-shirt at us as soon as, oh. we, as soon as we arrived, which was great. So it was good to, good to oh. see Kim and talk to him. And then a bit further on, we um, met another Space Nut case <laughs> Um, uh, down on the Murray River. We were at a place called Manham at the time, but we had a, a lovely um, dark sky event. Um, all the locals came out and we did some talks and uh, everybody dressed up in, in stars and spacey kind of stuff. One of our tour guests came fully clad in an astronaut suit, which apparently needed a pump to keep the air blowing through it so he didn't die. Uh, fantastic stuff. But there we also met uh, Tracy Hill, who's another space nut. Um, and uh, Tracy was very uh, gracious in the fact that she uh, took part in a, in a charity auction, uh, uh, which was to buy a copy of a book called Why Is Uranus Upside Down? That had something to do with me. Uh, so she <laughs> she paid a handsome price for that. And Tracy, well done. Um, there was a slight mix-up with Tracy's name when the winner was announced. Uh, so I had to rewrite the inscription in the book, but uh, it was great to meet Tracy. We had a nice chat. And we'll stay in touch with uh, both Kim and Tracy because these are people who are passionate about the district they live in and passionate about the things that they can show people wonderful all right hello kim hello tracy and thanks for being space nuts followers they're, they're all over the world i think you know you, you'd be hard pressed not to run into one these days the way things are going it's, <laughs> it's fantastic nice to be like that wouldn't it yeah, yeah. <laughs> i didn't run into any in china though when i was there a few uh, weeks ago, so. I, yes we've never had a question from china i don't think uh, so oh, yeah. but, that's right. more, more than welcome, more than welcome. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, you're back down to earth now, so to speak, and um, back to normal for a little while. Uh, but um, Space Nuts continues, and we're going to talk about Mars quakes now. Uh, and this is a really interesting story because we we have talked about Mars quakes before, uh, and they've been investigating them courtesy of the Insight mission. But now they're starting to come up with numbers that are a little bit um, bigger than. They expected. That's correct. Um, the uh, the the analysis of this, Andrew, comes from a spacecraft that's no longer operational. Our old friend Insight, uh, which was fitted with uh, a seismograph, uh, seismometers, to measure Mars quakes, um, mm. and um, the bottom line with this story is that. Uh, some of the Mars quakes have been misinterpreted, um, uh, which um, is easy to do when you're looking at a record of, uh, I guess, little tremors um, that um, you know you don't really have much of a of a of a clue with that tremor as to where they come from. We did talk about this recently, actually, because um, some people said when you've only got one seismometer, how do you know where these tremors are coming from? And there's various signatures in the tremors that you can interpret as to what the what the path that these tremors have taken through uh, through the... Um, you know, through the Martian crust, what the, that path is. Uh, so this is work uh, that has been carried out by uh, scientists at ETH Zurich, which you might know is the university that uh, Einstein attended, and Imperial College London. And I once did a course there, so <laughs> there you go. Uh, it's, um, it's a common ground for us in the world of astronomy. Uh, so these scientists, what they've done is they've uh, essentially... Um, made a, 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 a kind of estimate from the seismic data from uh, InSight 
as to the global meteorite impacts. Um, and that gives them a number uh, of somewhere in the region, the, they quote between 280 and 360 meteorites strike the planet each year, forming impact craters greater than eight metres, which is about 26 wow. feet. So these are these are impact craters that you could detect from space, um, you know, with the various Mars or orbiting spacecraft. And indeed they have. They've managed to link, and I think this is the, the crux of the matter, they've managed to link... Um, some of the seismic traces with with what are obviously newly excavated uh, impact craters so that y y you can tell by the color if, if you're looking down from uh, an orbiting spacecraft and you and you you see something that um, has a particular color against the red of the of the martian dust uh, you can get a, a clue as to whether that crater is a new one or not whether that uh, that is the result of a recent impact and in fact i think they've, they've been able to to tie down um uh, the, 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 some of the seismic traces with a particular new uh, impact feature uh, so and so Basically, what it means is uh, that it's, I think it's something, something like five times uh, the number of impacts that we thought were hitting the surface is what is now estimated from this new new research. Um, mm. And um, what they, the conclusion they come to, actually, let me quote uh, uh, Geraldine Zenhuizen uh, from uh, ETH Zurich, uh, who says... Uh, the rate was about five times higher than the number estimated from orbital imagery alone. Aligned with orbital imagery, our findings demonstrate that seismology is an excellent tool for measuring impact rates. So there's that link between what you can see from orbit and what the seismograph is telling you. I'm fascinated by this because you know, they're giving us numbers in the hundreds, but Earth gets hit to the tune of thousands a year. Uh, yeah. And we we don't seem to see those sorts of cratering effects. What What's the difference? Is it because Mars atmosphere is so thin and yes, can't that's resist? Correct. That's right. Mm. Um, so, you know, if, 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 Ma, if we had the same uh, atmospheric density as Mars, uh, two or three hundred eight-metre craters <laughs> every year would be headline making news um you yeah. know because we just sort of you won't really want to go anywhere with well, without experiencing the risk of something hitting you on the head that could cause an eight meter crater um and so th that's um you know that's the, the the crucial part is that mars mars's atmospheric pressure is 0 0.06 sorry it's 0.6 percent not 0.6 percent of Earth's atmospheric pressure is less than one percent. So there's much uh, less of a breaking influence by the atmosphere on Mars than there is on Earth. Um, and by breaking, that's B R E uh, B R A K I N G, not B R E A K I N G. Uh, so, um, so what it means is that uh, these meteorites always hit Mars's surface at very high velocity. What they call hyper hyperbola hypervelocity impacts. Uh, and mm. it's that that really betrays the uh, to, to orbiting spacecraft that reveals that something's happened recently because they, uh, they apparently cause a, a debris zone around the crater, which is more than 100 times bigger than the crater itself. Uh, so it, it, they stand out from orbit. You've got a crater maybe eight metres across, and that's pretty big. But with something 800 metres, uh, you know, around it that tells you that there's, there's something's happened there. Um, so and, and actually the, the points made uh, in the paper that they've written, uh, knowing, knowing the number of impacts is going to be really important for uh, the safety of of any explore, exploring spacecraft, whether they're robotic or whether they've got humans on board. And I suppose there'd be no pattern to this. So you, you, if, I, I guess if you had the time to analyse it, you might be able to figure out where and when these things might happen. But, uh, you know, you'd, 
it, it, yeah, it increases the risk. I mean, if this was Earth, our insurance policies just wouldn't be, we couldn't afford them. But um, <laughs> that's, right. <laughs> that's right. When you're talking space, space missions, missions in an environment that's hostile and we're not built to suit Mars's atmosphere, um, yeah, yeah, you'd want to collate as much data as possible to try and avoid these situations, I imagine. Yes. Uh, so so it, it's obviously something that will be taken into account in, in future um, future mission planning. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a warning, really, that um, Mars is a rather more hostile ex, uh, environment than we expected. Uh, at the same time, it's not it's not going to rule out Mars exploration. You know, I, don't, I think it's safe to say uh, that uh, we've had how many rovers on Mars? You know, it's, oh. it's probably it's probably it's probably ten if you include the Chinese rovers. You include uh, uh, not just Spirit and Opportunity and Curiosity and Perseverance. They're the big four, uh, but there were rovers before that. Pathfinder was one of them. Uh, maybe it's not ten, but perhaps. Uh, Six, seven or eight, something like that, uh, rovers on Mars. Mm. None of them, as far as we know, have been zonked by a, uh, by an incoming meteorite. So it's it's a risk, but it's a low risk. Yes, yes. And, and, and I suppose we should also say that uh, not all these um, Earth tremors that have been picked up over uh, the course of this mission uh, are caused by meteorites. So mm. Yes, that's correct. There's been yeah. other factors as well, and some of them are still a bit of a mystery. Y yes, um, so so that that's really the I guess the whole point of their argument that they've been able to isolate the ones just by their characteristic signature. They've been able to isolate the ones that are caused by meteorites rather than by yeah. <clears throat> tectonic activity. There isn't much tectonic activity on Mars uh, in that regard. It's, it's its core is much cooler than the Earth, and so it doesn't drive the tectonic activity that we have. <clears throat> Okay. Um, if you want to follow up on that story, it's been published in the journal Nature Astronomy. This is Space Nuts. Andrew Dunkley here with Professor Fred Watson. Zero G and I feel fine. Space Nuts. Uh, this next story is uh, interesting too, Fred, in that uh, we've been hearing about, well, we, we've heard about this once before, but it's uh, it's happened again. The Parker Solar Probe, which is orbiting the sun and has been since, oh gosh, was it? It's been up there for uh, five or six years, I think, yeah. something like that. Uh, it's just achieved or equaled a, um, a speed record uh, during one of its recent orbits. And we're talking numbers that are just mind-blowing. I mean, tens of th hundreds of thousands of kilometres, and it? oh, it's amazing. It uh, it is so. So the Parker Solar Probe is is interesting. It's one we haven't talked about much, uh, but it's been uh, it has been active, uh, as you've said, for some years. Uh, it's just completed its twentieth close approach to the sun, um, and that's telling you that this is the the spacecraft that comes closest to the sun of all the uh, solar orbiting spacecraft that we have launched, this one is the closest. Um, and in, in fact, its uh, 20th close approach uh, was on the 30th of June, 2024, not very long ago. Uh, its distance was 7.26 million kilometres from the solar surface. And by that, we mean the photosphere, the bit beyond which you can't see. The sun doesn't have a surface because it's a ball of gas. Um, mm. And that's about 4.51 million miles. So it's, uh, you know, in terms of cosmic distances, that is grazing the surface of the sun. It's very, very close. And, and um, Kepler's laws tell us that uh, the closer you get to, you, to the body that you are orbiting around, the faster your velocity is. It's how it works. And that's why we've got this uh, record speed. Um, in miles an hour, it's 394,736 kilometres per hour. It's 635,266 kilometres per hour, no. um, which, uh, let me do it in my head, uh, is somewhere under 200 kilometres per second. I, I, I haven't got a calculator handy, but it's in that region. You divide, you divide it by 3,600 to get kilometres per hour into kilometres per second. So it's, yeah. it's in the region of 200. Uh, it's, um, yeah, that's a phenomenal velocity. Um, and at that speed, 
you've really got to take relativity into account, um, not not just because of the speed, but because of the gravitational potential that you're in. You know, you're in a strong mm-hmm. gravitational field, and both of those things um, mean that uh, Einstein's two theories of relativity, the special theory, which is about speed, and the general theory, which is about gravity, uh, those two absolutely start dominating your calculations. So really interesting stuff for all kinds of reasons. Um the Parker Solar Probe is is uh, fixed, fitted with heat shields that uh, seem to be withstanding the stresses and strains on the spacecraft that come from being so close to the sun. And we look forward to hearing what uh, data have been collected during that 20th close approach to the sun. Yeah, it seems to operate in a very complex orbital pattern because uh, it uses gravity assist through, yeah. uh, from Venus uh, in yeah. some situations, just depends on... You know what's available at the time. I think but, uh, <laughs> yes. it would all be mapped out. Uh, but it, it will be doing its next pass on the twenty fourth of December, and they expect it will probably crack near seven hundred thousand kilometers an hour mm. in that pass. <laughs> um, and that's just unthinkable, isn't it? This has got to be the fastest thing ever. Uh, yeah, that's that's well, it, that's right. It's. Um... You know, it's uh, not the fastest that was launched, but because it's been wound up by all these gravity assists to push it so near the sun, uh, yes, it probably is the fastest spacecraft ever. I, w- I wonder how it survives uh, the uh, the environment that it's exposed to. I mean, just the radi- radiation it's bombarding yeah. it for, for yeah. one, but... Uh, it would be exposed to tremendous heat, wouldn't it? Yes, that's right. So, so it's got a pretty substantial heat sh- heat shield. Which, um, if I'm remembering correctly, I think it uh, turned, the spacecraft is turned so that when it's closest to the sun, the heat the heat shield is doing all the work. Uh, um, and um, you know, while while the spacecraft kind of behind the heat shield uh, is faking the measurements. So, uh, yeah, very intriguing and very, very successful mission, actually. Um, so I think it's got, um, f- is it four more or three more pa- uh, close passes to the sun? I think it's three more. Um, and um, actually, uh, no, it's four more. It's got four more close passes. So, so the the mission is is sort of coming to uh, its closing phases. But uh, we will no doubt hear more about it. We probably should uh, do a nice story on the Parker Solar Probe at some time yeah. down the track when we see some of these results. Yeah, I've just found it. The uh, the final pass will be next year, the twenty fourth flyby of the sun. So its mission comes to an end in twenty twenty five. But right, um, so. I mean that, and that's how long it takes to sort of work its way into position to do a pass, because yes. um, it's going so fast. It just it can't just sort of stop and go back. It's got to go out and they'll do another lap around whatever. It can do a lap around. Mercury would be involved, I imagine. But, uh, yeah, it's quite extraordinary. Uh, what, a, what a fascinating mission. And, yes, we should uh, talk more about it when they start releasing some of the data, I, I guess. Um, uh, who knows what they could learn. There's so much we don't know about the sun, which makes it such an interesting thing. And it is the nearest star to our planet, so we can learn a lot about things that are so far away and untouchable just by observing what's right next door. Yeah, uh, Fred, right. uh, let's get on to our final story. This one I also find intriguing, and this one dates back to the year 1181 when there was a supernova recorded, uh, but we're only now starting to learn more about it. Yeah, that's right. Um uh, 1181, uh, it's a time we, we often associate these um, supernova, ancient supernova uh, explosions or observations with Chinese scientists. And in fact, probably, probably the best known is the supernova of 1054, uh, which was observed by Chinese uh, scientists. Um, if I can call them that, they were certainly uh, uh, assiduous observers of the sky. Uh, that 1054 uh, supernova is what produced the Crab Nebula, one of the most famous supernova remnants in the sky in the northern constellation of Taurus the Bull. The Crab Nebula is well studied. And in fact, we've not in the last few months seen some extraordinary images of it from the, the, from the web. Uh, space telescope, James Webb Space Telescope. But this one uh, is different. The supernova of 1181 was recorded, uh, it was recorded throughout Asia, but um, mostly in Japan. Uh, Japan uh, was, uh, you know, again, uh, the 
of, of people who were very, very clever, clever and careful sky watchers. And um, it's a, a time actually when uh, Japan was at war uh, mm. with, um, with, you know, <laughs> As, as often was the case in, in past history, it seems to be still the case today, uh, but Japan uh, was uh, at war and uh, there were records kept of that time uh, which uh, were put in a kind of, uh, it's what's described by um, our old friend org, which is the uh, website that's carrying this story, uh, described as in diary format. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's like a journal, I guess, uh, called the Azuma Kagami. I hope I'm pro pronouncing that correctly, um, which chronicled what was going on, uh, the events taking place, mostly to do with the war. This was all not very far from modern-day Tokyo. Uh, but other things, including this appearance of the new star, um, they, they, uh, they are called a guest stars in those ancient texts because they're just a guest in the sky that then goes away. And indeed... Um, yeah. Uh, there, there is a note here that they were that this one was in, uh, also observed in China and Korea as well, um, and was bright enough to be quite noticeable. It wasn't a daylight supernova, which we think the ten fifty four one was, um, but uh, was um, bright. It's comparable in brightness to the planet Saturn, which is certainly noticeable. It's not the brightest of the planets, but it's uh, up there with the uh, with um, the, the the ones that y you really do notice in the in the night sky. Um, apparently, it was visible for about 180, de 180 days, uh, and then dimmed away and was lost. And it took a long time uh, for. Uh, modern day scientists to find it <laughs> um they what's happened is that uh basically using the 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 the, the, the you know the text of this diary record of of the supernova the azuma kagami um people have narrowed things down uh to a co the constellation of cassiopeia which is another it's a far northern constellation in the northern sky we we don't see it from uh certainly from the latitude where i am in sydney uh but um it uh so that gave the scientists enough of a clue to look for a remnant from this explosion and it's quite different from the remnant from the crab nebula which is just like a tangle of of uh, material dust and gas uh, that's that's obviously uh, got shock waves propelling through it in all different kinds of directions this is something quite different uh, mm. first of all it's visible in x-rays and what we have is an, an x-ray image from the xmm satellite uh, with uh, with some uh, infrared uh, component as well from a, an infrared spacecraft called WISE. So we're looking at this in two different wave bands. And uh, what we can see in the structure is, uh, it's first of all, it's a spherical object um, which has some really detailed, uh, what, what we might call contours in it, where you've got... Things like, first of all, at the, at, in the middle, we've got the wind bubble. This is coming from the paper about this. Uh, then there's uh, going outwards a wind termination shock, and then a region of unshocked ejector. That's material that's come from the explosion but hasn't had a shock wave going through it. And then there's something called a reverse shock, <laughs> and then a forward shock. <laughs> and all this complexity uh, can be uh, sort of seen in the uh, in the X-ray image. <laughs> And uh, yeah, it sounds like my golf game. <laughs> got forward shocks in it. I, I <laughs> too, much just, wind, too much can, wind and too, too much shock. <laughs> can just see you doing a reverse shock with your uh, number five iron or whatever. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. <laughs> but the, uh, that study has given enough detail that scientists can now work out what this supernova was. And it's a very rare one, something that does not normally happen um two white dwarf stars now white dwarf stars are 
what our sun will end up as. It's uh, a, a, a basically a thing the size of the Earth, uh, but with the density, with the mass of a star, so very, very dense um, and very hot. Uh, that's how the sun will end its days in a few billion years' time. Uh, but two of these objects apparently have collided, and, and that's what has caused this very unusual type of supernova. Uh, a lot of right. the work has, done, has been done with computer modeling, of course, um, and um, uh, analyzing the observations. Uh, and the, the, the rarity is this double shock formation that we've just spoken about, the forward shock and the reverse shock and then the inner shock. Um, and so they, uh, there is a... Um, a, a a sort of footnote to the story, though, uh, that comes from these observations. The the sort of winds that blow from this event, what we call stellar winds, um, they are thought to be relatively recent in their formation. So that they, they say perhaps only within the past 20 or 30 years, these high-speed stellar winds have been blowing from the surface of the star, which is quite extraordinary, really. Just, you know, we happen to be looking at it at the right time uh, to yeah. see uh, some of the action. Yeah, indeed. And uh, it's, it's, you know, we, we get very lucky sometimes with observations, but I suppose we could also suggest that these things are happening so regularly it, it, maybe it's not luck. We're just picking them up because they're happening in, at a rate of a dime a dozen. But this one, this one's different. This one's been quite unusual and uh, a very lucky discovery indeed. My hope, Fred, one day is we do get to see one for real in our lifetime. Um, uh, Beetlejuice being the optimum candidate, I suppose. Yeah, that's correct. It's uh, it's uh, we don't want one too close, Andrew. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, Be Betelgeuse yeah. is about uh, Betelgeuse, or however you pronounce it. Uh, it's about mm. seven hundred light years away, I think. Which is, uh, it's it's far enough away that we would certainly see something uh, visible in the daylight sky. It would be very bright, uh, but is not um, going to be lethal to life on Earth, which a nearer one might be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and in recent discussions, we've talked about things that have happened so far away from us that have actually affected our atmosphere. So you, yes, that's right. You, it, it, it is really mind-boggling to to consider that there's so much influence out there that is so far away, and we we think we're all safe and well, and we are. But um, yeah, you just always got to consider the possibilities, I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, that uh, story was published in the Astrophysical Journal. If you're interested in finding out about uh, the SN 1181 supernova, uh, Fred, we've reached the end of the program. Thank you so much. Well, it's a great pleasure, Andrew. Uh, it's not a pleasure to have reached the end, but it's always a pleasure to talk about these things. The end is nigh. Uh, yes, no yes, yes, um, right. problem. <laughs> um, we'll see you on the next episode. Sounds good. Thanks very much, Andrew. Take care and we'll speak soon. Fred Watson, astronomer at large. And thanks for listening. Don't forget to follow us on social media or if you're on YouTube, hit the subscribe button and uh, don't forget to visit our web website, spacenutspodcast.com. Oh, and thanks to Hugh in the studio who couldn't be with us today. Uh, but uh, all the best to his wife who's dealing with uh, some medical issues as we all are when we reach this age. And from me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks for your company. See you on the next episode of Space Nuts. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.